Uh, good morning. So last night, session two of the Broadland uh, campaigns. Um, Brian, his wife Katie, and her little brother Josh. We played our second play test uh, of Dark Age of Man in Broadland. So um, remember, our basically right now our Dark Age of Man has its own setting, which is based loosely on a fictional United Kingdom, 1850 to 1200, right, A.D., and uh, I'm working on a map that will go with the book of that, too, all fictionalized uh, U.K., basically, well, at least the, the island. Okay, so Dark Age of Man. Uh, if you guys remember last time, uh, Brian's dwarf, Tobar, had negotiated um, and bought a lot of, of raw ore from Ralson's um, mine, which was closing due to some a mass exodus of his employees, his miners, uh, due to some evil thing that was killing the miners. And uh, Celeste uh, and Hillstow, uh, Hillshaw, excuse me, Hillshaw, uh, uh, go with him with a wagon, and they journey to the mine, the, Ral the Ralson mine, and they collect. They spend a as, long, as much as they can collecting all the raw ore into the wagons with, with a couple of horses, a couple of mules, uh, and they headed toward Twin Tops. And uh, again, uh, one of our goals with Dark Age of Man is to give the players a lot of agency. Uh, they are not in control of all the truth of the world, but they can place themselves in the place. And, uh, you know, and Brian did. The first session, Brian said, hey, I'm a dwarf trader from Twin Tops, and I'm here to purchase raw ore for a deal for the dwarf, uh, the dwarf uh, silver companies. I said, "Awesome, let's let's do it." And the others did not mind that that was kind of the direction. Uh, so now they're of course in route, right? So midway on route, they ran into refugees. Remember, we're using a random seed generator, and I had rolled before we started. Before when we ended the last. Uh, session I had rolled nine on this table nine is a spy among the leaders of the court well they're on the road right there so any village they come to that could be true any city they go to that could be true uh, or of course twin tops that could be true and so I kind of set that aside and thought yeah that'll be great for twin tops they'll call in a, if they roll into twin tops if they ever get there it's quite a distance I mean we're talking leagues and uh, then I'll worry about maybe there's a little intrigue in the court maybe I could change the court to uh, you know, to the silver company, right? The the board members of the silver company. There's some there's some spy industrial espionage. You know, who cares, right? It's, it's fantasy. But they didn't get there, so I didn't have to worry about it. But I decided I wasn't going to use that for the first village they come into. They did not get there. Uh, so most important about session two, they were adjourning. This was almost a hex crawl. Broadlands, my my Broadlands campaign that we played with Sword and Wizardry Continual Light for uh, many, many sessions is a hex crawl, right? It just doesn't have hexes on the map. We use a, a, a any kind of figurine, and that figurine's the, the distance they can move per turn. A turn is a day, and we roll, right? So it's a hex crawl uh, campaign world with cities and, and dungeons and things like that. So they come across, the, on their journeys, traveling, they come across the crypt uh, among um, an old what appears to be an old religious uh, temple or shrine or something. Hard to say because it's, it's in ruins, lay in ruins. But there is an old crypt. And, of course, uh, Celeste and Hillshaw cannot, uh, cannot uh, decline the invitation to explore the crypt. Uh, as Tobar is, is basically a traitor. And he's not really interested in anything except getting to Twin Tops as soon as possible with one and a half tons of raw silver ore from Ralston's mine. Top grade silver, a lot of good silver in this ore. Less ore, more silver, right? I mean, more ore, less stone, right? Uh, so he declines. He decides he's going to set camp with the mules and the horses, stay at camp and watch while Celeste and Hillshaw decide to investigate this crypt. But they decide to wait until morning because, as you know, Celeste created her own, her own um, uh, religious sect that tries to work only during daylight hours. They are not... They, 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 they basically try to shut everything down at night and rest and meditate, and that's when they pray. That's when they do religious ceremonies, etc., 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 and I thought that's so cool. So Celeste, they wait till morning. Uh, things go fine through the evening, um, and of course, I've, I've got, this is a crypt that's among my random, this is a crypt that's actually among my random uh, area on the map, my random stuff. This crypt pops up. It's ultimately skeletons uh, and, and potential ghouls, zombies, right? 
And so I rolled up all that stuff as they as they um, as they peruse the crypt, and of course it was skeletons. They end up in a in a battle with the skeletons. She uses her spirit, and this is why we designed this game. Not all conflict has to be with weaponry. We try to resolve. We don't want the game to be just like Nuns and Dragons, where it's basically murder, hobo, travel, kill, travel, kill, travel, kill. The goal is to say is to give players a chance to play in fantasy worlds, but it's not always combat is not always the end end of conflict or the, the beginning and the end of conflict. And so she literally prays and she she blows skeletons into pieces with prayers, right? So very cool. She never draws her weapon, her shield. She narrates uh, again, all you have to do in our game is succeed the role. If you succeed the role, your narration directs the truth, right? So she narrates how these skeletons, as I as I wound them, how they lose ribs and arms. And uh, uh, the skeletons have, I think, one wound. Um, I rolled up a couple of skeletons that were of creatures they'd never seen before. I gave those two wounds. So they were these, uh, they couldn't tell by the skeleton creature what it was originally. Oh, could it have been a wolf? Was it some kind of demon? Whatever. But it was it was the skeletal structure of something non-human, non-humanoid. Those had two wounds, and she would describe how her as she would pray, and uh, the, the the skeletons would stumble, and their legs would rip off, or their arms, and it was, it was fantastic. They were surrounded by about twelve of these skeletons. They were dispatching them. Hillshaw again, um, uh, fully healed. The, the the night before, she fully healed Hillshaw, who had been injured from their previous encounter with the ruffians. Uh, this is in the crypt. Literally, they traveled up over the ruins, down and around. They investigated around the crypt. They found a handful of, of, of old relics and things that appeared to be of no value. However, um, they believe they should take them back to Tobar and let Tobar, the traitor, evaluate them. And he's not in hearing distance of these fights as they got down into the crypts. The crypts the doors were dilapidated. They could travel into the into the crypts themselves and work their way through without a whole lot of problems. However, they ended up in the heart, the the chamber, surrounded by twelve skeletons. They dispatched all but a handful. They had to retreat as Hillshaw, unfortunately, was losing many of his combat rolls. Uh, we were using the bait eight, which means uh, the changes you uh, you uh, everything were the, the 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 minimalist score you need on the d20 is an eight modified by the CV of the creature, modified by the weaponry and your abilities. So you got a really good chance to hit eight if you're say a plus two body and you got good weaponry, you're gonna you're gonna hit any base eight thing. But it's base eight plus the CV of the creatures. I did these as a mob, so they were up against a mob which was significant and uh they were uh taking uh, so 12, basically, I put into two mobs. They were uh, fighting two different mobs of six, basically. And anyway, uh, Hill, uh, Hillishaw, uh, Hillshaw had to back out um, as she was praying and dispatching them. As she was backing out, she had taken a couple of wounds, but they abandoned the crypt. These, th these creatures did not foray out of the crypt as they stayed protecting the crypt. And, uh, and the... Th uh, 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 Back to Tobar with what relics they had, badly wounded. She she prays and works to heal him one wound, and then he goes to to rest. He wants to rest and eat and drink uh, after she's healed him, hoping to gain another. And I told him at the end of this uh, this turn, he could roll again to see if he gains another wound back uh, due to uh, purposefully uh, resting, eating, nourishing himself, drinking plenty of fluids, etc. Et so I said, why not? Well, I mean, let's let's let him play, right? Let's let him use his body score to do that. And Hillshaw uh, fell that score. Uh, ironically, I made it a high CV because it's not in the rules, right? So to, that would have been earning two wound heals, which uh, without the help of medicine or magic or potions. And so I made that CV pretty high. He unfortunately fell that role. So, but he did get a wound back from her, her work. Uh, and he, again, was down to uh, three, two wounds when she healed him. So he was up to three. Um, where are my notes? Uh, let's see here. Okay, so that was on the random hex crawl generator. I didn't need my random seed generator because they're traveling. So I thought I'll just use my random hex stuff. It's the same concept, right? So when people say random seed has work, it's a lot like a hex crawl, except it is it is utterly unknown. No matter what direction the players go, no matter where they're at in the world, it can be put into context. That's how our random seed generator works. Uh, so they could be literally in a module that does exist that is written and then have random seed generators come into play to rec to, to, to affect that module or to affect the circumstances of a written adventure etc so we can use this with nothing 
which is how uh, Dell and I have been running it and playing it. And it's how our game is intended to be played. You're going to have a rough, loose idea of uh, Ungland and the surrounding city of Dredgewater, etc., etc., etc. But then it's kind of player agency. Let the players kind of decide certain things. And Okay. Anyway, they go back. They show Tobar these. And Tobar makes a couple of uh, 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 prestige checks against it. Now, why prestige? Uh, because prestige, he, descri he described his prestige was solely based on his abilities. He earned his repute, okay? So these guys are level three, remember, which is repute three. And when he described how his character earned his three repute, he earned it through being a trader, being a, a business person, being an evaluator of things. So I said, great, but prestige um, makes total sense, purse or prestige. Well, purse helps him evaluate the value of it. Um, and I, again, the CV base eight, no modifier. It's simple check for him. Uh, matter of fact, on two of the items, I just told him they're worthless. Uh, they might have been worth something if they were new, but now they're just old things that are, that, you know, uh, 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 so dilapidated, so damaged. They're they're not they're not magical. And and the one he had to make a check for base eight, easy check for him. Makes the roll. And he finds out it's worth us uh, about 25 silver pieces. And he throws that, literally pitches it in the back of the wagon with all the raw ore. So that's just more silver they can smell down, right? So that was, or they could uh, uh, get, they could they could sit, sp sell it for more silver, uh, you know, to smell or whatever, right? Okay, so he throws it in the back of the wagon. Uh, they rest there another evening. And this time, though, they hear about them in the middle of the night. Something moving about in the crypt, uh, in the uh, ruins. Uh, and uh, f uh, pursuing them. And at one point, late in the morning, uh, uh, Celeste being the last one awake, they, they allowed um, they allowed um, Hillshaw to rest the entire night. They didn't want to make him do any watch because they wanted him to get back another full uh, wound in the morning. And so she was in the final watch uh, after only so many hours of sleep. She did suffer a couple of wounds, but she wanted to be closer to daybreak for her character because this is part of the religious sect. And she spies on the edge of the ruins um, just an hour or so before dawn, uh, 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 the silhouettes of these boned shadows, these uh, skeletons. And they're perusing the, the, the ruins and they're combing the ruins, clearly looking for them. They came out obviously at night and they were obviously looking for these invaders, these, these two. Uh, they never get close enough to the camp. She watches them, keeps her head down, doesn't rouse anyone until they get close enough. She says some prayers of uh, protection, and I have her make a, a, a roll with a CV4, so 12 up. She makes the roll, I think she's 13 or 14, and I basically make it very hard for the skeletons to come this far toward their camp or to spot them. And they do uh, slink away before dawn, and uh, dawn up, they decide it's time to pack up and go. Uh, he heals another wound, so he's up to four of his seven, I believe seven, yeah, four of his seven. And she heals up her final wound. She doesn't have to use any prayers, and they head out after breakfast, uh, pack everything up. And again, they're heading toward the Turin Tops, which again is going to take them more than one session to arrive at. Uh, so again, using Broadlands... Um, uh, random hex crawl charts every turn they travel a day unless there's weather or poor or they're lost they don't they can't choose which direction if the right well none of that occurs they travel successfully in route where they want to go but the next tech reveals a small village which again is not on the maps of broadland it's it's it it comes up on the charts and here i decide uh to obviously to roll the condition of the village the, vi the village was in mourning uh, again, all that means is I got to figure out why the village is in a, a dark state or morning state. And then I thought I would go ahead and roll another random seed generator. And I rolled a 12, a 13, a threat of force from a neighboring clan. Okay. So that was very cool. So as they arrive, they're in mourning. And I've now I know uh, with 13, a threat of force from a neighboring clan, I know, okay, so they're in mourning because let's say this clan must have attacked them and maybe killed some of their, their leaders. Uh, maybe took away some of their women and children. So that is the story they learned from this small village. I don't name the village. It's just literally, it's a small, it's a small village. Uh, these kind of things exist in fantasy worlds. They stumble into this village. They see they're in mourning. They're on guard. Uh, it's clear with their wagon and their horse and things. They're not enemies. They come in. She goes to work on their injured and starts to heal. And she does a mass heal, which is so cool. She says, I, I cannot afford to call upon the gods 
for one at a time. Uh, I want everybody to join and, and bring the wounded here and I will do a mass heal. So she does this amazing description of a mass kind of ceremony heal. But she says we must do it before dark fall because we want the light of the power of the of the, uh, the sunshiners. Remember, remember, she's a sunshiner is what her, her, her religion is, sun, sunshiners. And she does this. And so, of course, I make the CV based on the number of people, like a mob fight. And she has to narrate what she's done, doing or saying. She makes a roll. And if she is successful, that's like instead of doing a wound, she hits the mob with a cure. And, and I set this up for four, just four rounds, basically, like a combat that I know is going to end in four rounds. And so she does this narration and then she rolls and these people, some of them are healed and up and some of them are, are improving. And a couple of them, I think she filled one of the rolls. And that small, uh, uh, that handful of people on this side of the tent didn't get as much healing. And anyway, it was very cool. So she used her heal for a mass heal, which was like, this is the whole point of Dark Age of Man. Think outside the box, right? You're free. There's no rule to say, no, you can do mass heal or no heal or whatever, right? There are certain rules that you've got to use your attributes in, in a narrative way to create these environments in which you can change the world, right? So be it. Meanwhile, she's exhausted, right? I tell her to do this, you're going to suffer a wound, right? Uh, and you're going to have to spend the evening uh, utterly exhausted from this. And so she's out of play, basically, through the evening. And that's when they hear the horns again from the darkness and uh, the, the, the local villagers scatter to defensive positions. They say this is the third night in a row. These crazy uh, 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 humanoid uh, uh, barbarians have been raiding them and they're trying to get... Uh, uh, they're trying to apparently either eradicate them or they think get all of their women and children because they've taken the, what women and children they get their hands on, but they also are trying to kill all the men. They're not certain if they want to decimate the whole village, if they want to take over the village, or if they just want to steal their women and children. They don't know. Well, Tobar is in no mood to try to fight barbarians. And so he, uh, he suggests... Um, a plan of action of, of total defense, uh, uh, you know, surround the women, put the women in one spot with the children, don't scatter them about, put them in one spot, surround them, and just work, make it as hard as possible to penetrate and steal any of these children and, 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 and kids. And the villagers uh, uh, agree with a easy check. I mean, it was a 10, CV2, eight, base 8, CV2, so 10 plus. He makes the check with his prestige. And uh, Celeste, of course, is out of action. She's with all the women and children. And they are, uh, uh, they, they come pouring in from the northwest side of the camp like, a, like a, the head of a spear. Therefore, um, uh, and then once they hit, they start scattering, looking for someone to fight, looking through the, how, the tents and the, the small huts. And they realize they're all in one location. So they all run toward that group, that mass of people that are protecting one hut one common kind of a common house but not very big but big enough to house what's left of the women and children and celeste uh they fight valiantly uh hillshaw goes down he's unfortunately killed uh um uh, uh tobar is badly wounded and, and 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 uh narrating all of his fight as a defense so all if he succeeds he does damage but I also make it more, I also lower his ability to uh, succeed at defending himself every turn he's successful. So he never actually narrates he's trying to kill somebody, but he narrates he's fighting them off to protect himself and not let them get past him. Meanwhile, they breach this, they get into the hut, there's too many of them, and Celeste is one that is taken. And she's hauled away, uh, praying and screaming. She manages to dispatch two of these, two of these barbarian men are terrified by her her uh, rants of prayer in the middle of the night and they leave her be but then she's ultimately overcome and these are all narrative combat rounds so conflict so we don't have combat we have conflict we do all conflict the same it just depends on how you narrate what what of your attributes and gear come into play and she's hauled away with many of the women and children uh, Hillshaw lay dead, Tobar oh, badly wounded, and there's about six to eight of these men left, most of them wounded. Uh, all of the children now at this point, and all the women that were left are gone. There was about 12, by the way, about uh, eight women and four children, and now and Celeste. Okay, two of the women were killed in fighting to protect their children, but uh, so it was like six women plus Celeste and uh, four children taken. 
Uh, about six men left plus Tobar. Hillshaw dead. Josh's character's dead. Uh, and that's where we ended session two playtest of Dark Age of Man. And this was fantastic. Uh, I, this time I we did we played uh, uh, number one we didn't start so late last time I did this it was late on a uh, what was a Friday night or something it was hard because it was late uh, we started yesterday afternoon it was much easier got done got home was able to get home and relax with my wife last night etc etc I'm not too tired but here's the thing so Broadland's working great for this right it doesn't matter Broadland was written it it, it uh, Broadland is no um, it's system agnostic. And I use it with Sword and Wizard Continual Light. But it can be used with any fantasy setting, right, genre. So I'm using it with this, right? Uh, this time we had time, though, to talk more. And I said, I want, please now, feedback. Hillshaws, you guys have seen plenty of conflict now. You've utilized the system and your attributes to do unconventional things like the mass heal. Um, the, uh, the, uh, her spiritual fight against the skeletons. Uh, um, Hillshaw dies, right? Okay, so I said I've got it now. Please, we need. I need more feedback. We've had two sessions now. I need a little more feedback. And Josh, who's incredibly quiet, does the same. Well, this time I got feedback. Uh, Brian uh, has played with me a long time. You know, he's one of my old group. Uh, Katie's only played with me now maybe four or five times total. Josh has played with me three times, I believe. Okay. Uh, uh, Brian just loves to play, but he, he, uh, he, they, how do I say this? I don't want to say too simple, but Josh clearly thinks it lacks, um, uh, how do I say this? He thinks it clearly lacks, um, I don't want to say guidance, um, depth, uh, maybe, um, and maybe that's because they don't see the rule book. I mean, they only saw how to create characters. They see only this. I mean, I got... All three of their characters scribble down on one sheet of paper. That's how simple our game is. This is Tobar, Celeste, and Hillshaw. Uh, when you can fit all three characters scribble down on a notebook paper, um, that's pretty simple, right? And uh, Josh, uh, in the best way he could, I think was saying it needs more. It needs. We need more to know. I think they just feel... Too simple, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Uh, Brian's played uh, Sword Wizard Continue Light, which is very simple, but it's still D D20. It's still, it's still, as simple as it is, it, you can still hearken to all the D20 experiences you've ever had, and it makes you feel like you're playing a game that's loaded with all the D20 rule sets, right? I mean, pick, pick a D20 game, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it Inherently in that, and Ivan and I talked about this years ago, is every D20 game we've ever played, right, can pop up. The rules for those, from all, every amalgamation of every D20 game we've ever played, could show up. Or we could call upon in our DM's brain to say, I remember a game that used to do this with healing, let's do it for this. So all of those D20 games, in mass, those experiences make us better GMs because we can utilize all those rules and not break the game, so to speak, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so uh, Katie loves it because she is not, she is not feeling that she's following some set of uh, spells. She's not following some uh, limited idea of what she can and cannot do that makes her either fully religious or partially religious, or committed only to being uh, religious until her spells run out. Then she's a fighter with a mace, right? Which is a cleric, right? A cleric is a fighter, and then when his, all of his spells are gone or her spells are gone, she's basically a fighter with a mace. What's the point? Uh, how religious am I indeed, right? So she loves it. Brian, of course, uh, kept his mouth shut on this uh, post-session. Last time he gave good uh, feedback, especially about um, being in control of saying where his guys come from, what he's here to do. And then he had the wonderful bidding session where he bid on the ore and scored it for his Twin Tops uh, silver uh, business, whatever, right? So, so cool, right? But that... So he had plenty of feedback. Is that first session kind of featured Brian's character, Tobar, more? Here, Tobar, Brian played it again. What I love is their role playing. Tobar doesn't want to be in combat. Tobar's not a, he's not, his repute was built as a traitor. He has body because he's a dwarf and he's capable of self defense. But he, he, he really didn't want to fight and he didn't want to kill. And it was brilliant how when he defended the clan from the invaders, Everything he narrated was just stopping. I'm just stopping that guy from getting by me. I'm 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 defending with my shield against the, uh, the this mob of angry barbarians trying to kill me. 
and he manages to stay on his feet. Meanwhile, unfortunately, Hillshaw, who's basically an elf archer, goes down. He doesn't quite, he can't withstand it. But see, he's more aggressive. Josh is more aggressive as he dives into battle. He's not afraid to throw himself because he sees himself as an elf mercenary. Well, that is his repute. He was an elf mercenary who fought on behalf of the clans. So he even recognized, at one point, he, he adds to the clan by saying, oh, I've heard of these guys. They are, uh, they are madness incarnate, right? So Josh actually adds lore to this clan that's created randomly out of the book. And it, it can be true, right? That's his experience with them. It may not be totally true, but it's his character's experience hearing about this clan or, or, or having faced people like this before. So it was fantastic. And he died, which I think also reminded them that uh, D20 is definitely lethal. Our game has proved at times... Uh, uh, only in a handful of playtests, nobody's died yet. This is the first time, but of course they they are playing in my Broadland game, which was is written to be a little more dangerous, especially when you're not around the cities, and so they're going to encounter more conflict and, and more dangerous things. And uh, Hillshaw's th all three times has been badly wounded. Uh, the first one against the ruffians, the second one in the crypt, and then of course uh, last night t uh, take or yesterday taken on. Uh, much of this clan mob on top of that. He just succumbed. He finally succumbed. Uh, it was fantastic. And so we ended it there. I don't know if we'll do with session three. If we do, we're, they're definitely divided. Tobar's alone. Celeste has been taken by the clan. We thought it would be a perfect place to call these uh, the story of these characters done. And if we do play any more playtesting of Dark Age of, we'll use probably Ungoland, and they'll start, um, they'll start in Dredgewater, and they'll play... A Dark Age of Man with its setting. If we play any more Dark Age of Man, I'm not certain how much we'll play. Uh, this I, I kind of pushed this because um, we just came off session one and I wanted to get back to it and do another play test before we get away from this before winter hits. Um, and I can tell you know they want to they want to play. They've invited me to GM and this I chose to do this last time. I then said let's get together one more time quickly and do this. Um, I don't know how much they want to play old d and I mean, uh, how much they want to play, uh, uh, play test my game. They enjoyed it. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, Katie loves the freedom, and I think Brian gets it. But I think the gist, I got the gist last night, finally, in a way, through Josh. They feel it's too simple. And I think they feel it. there's not enough, um, there's not enough ground. I get, how do I put this? Um, how did they put it? I'm trying to remember the terms exactly. They said it was, I think Josh said un, I, he feels unguided by the rules, meaning the, the rules aren't given him, um, and they are, they're meant, it's meant to be solely your attributes and your, in, your creative, intuitive thoughts about how to do a thing, as we talked about with Katie. Katie said that, bring him to here, I'm going to do a mass heal, I don't have the power to heal everybody individually. And she declared those rules, and she made sense of it. And I could have stopped her and said, that's not cool, we're not going to allow that, but why not, right? The CV was based on a mob thing that was going to take four rounds of her doing this, and they were all healed individually that way. And it worked because I'm able to uh, modify, I'm able to say, okay, how does this go, and how does she How does she narrate it, and that's going to affect wounds on these injured people. Um I think it's brilliant for intuitive players, players that are creative and imaginative. Uh, but no, there is no set list of skills. There's no set list of what his elf can do, right? For instance, I, you know, he's accustomed to elf having racial traits, and he's accustomed to his elf being able to see 60 feet in the dark, and he's accustomed to his elf being able to... No, they were, he's just an elf. In our game, it's just he just made himself an elf, and that's whatever you want to make that elf be. Now, in Broadland, it's based... Uh, on 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 elves and dwarves etc that are kind of traditional fantasy from just about any D&D old D&D or sword and wizardry game you can get so anyway we only had one random seed generator I decided to roll it as they came across the small village which came out of the hex crawl it turned out to be a threat from a invading clans they uh, you know she healed they had this uh, moment where they learned all that information and then the clans attacked that night and there it is game over um, I don't know if they'll play again. I'm not certain they uh, get it. or uh, I, I know they get it. I just don't know if it's their cup of tea. And I'm okay with that. I mean, you want play testers to be honest. Uh, you want them to want to play what you're doing or at least be intrigued by what you're doing. I think they feel like they've... They, um, I think they want more of a game. And that's 
uh, I'm guessing because they don't use the terminology uh, that I'm trying to use, but I think they want more of a traditional game. d and is a game, right? God, is that my, is that my focus? What the f um, So d and is a game, and therefore it has this kind of paradigm to play, and a paradigm of adventure, and a paradigm of who can invent what, and a paradigm of what is expected. They know they need to prepare their heroes. They know they need to they need to stock up for expeditions. They know there's only so many spells and so many ways to heal and so many ways to hunt and eat and ration your food. They know that the crowbar does this and they know the rope does that. And they know the pole does this. They want a more traditional paradigm of the traditional gaming. And they know in D&D 5th edition, which is what this group plays the most, this is how how I met Brian. He was, he'd been playing Pathfinder in D&D 5th edition and running Pathfinder in D&D 5th edition. Um, those things, even in D and D Fifth Edition, aren't so aren't so uh, traditional, so to speak. But but they have traditional races and they have the traditional sis, s math system. They can look and say, "Hey, I'm going to get to add plus six to my next lightning strike when I go to level two or whatever." They can they can just see that there's a game there, right? There's this underlying I don't say tabletop game, but there's an underlining game. Ours is a as Dell and I said, we're not going to call ours a game. It's called a role-playing experience. The so Dark Age of Man is a role-playing experience. It's not. We don't title it a game because there's no sense of win or lose, and there's no sense of an eve, of a zero breakout. Right? There's no Nash's equal equilibrium where all tactics and strategies being exactly equal will come out zero. Will come out even, and maybe somewhere, right? Uh, something will change. But uh, this is meant to be a role-playing experience. Characters in a world, yes, they use dice, and yes, they're up against traditional uh, threats, conflicts, adventures, etc. But there is no paradigm of a, of, a, of a game, so to speak. And I think that's what they're trying to say. They're not using those terms. Uh, but they ultimately, the gist of it was, Josh said, there's no guidance. He doesn't feel there's any guidance. Um, uh Yet he understands that attributes are added to the die 20. The die 20 is a base 8 plus a CV of the challenge. And he just has to roll that equal to or that or better. So that's the rules. The rules in a nutshell. For anybody out there curious, how does Dark Age of Man work? That's it. I just described it. That, that's, our, that's our rules. And so most people are going to say, wow, that's a one-page RPG. Yeah, I suppose it is. It's also, it, it is that simple. Um, it is designed, though, to be less about... Um, uh, utilizing this, the known paradigm of rules and more uh, to allow players to be imaginative and create the narrative space that makes sense for why their character is spiritual or why their character is smart or why their character is practicing witchcraft or why their character is wielding a shield and a spear and, and trying to become the, the king of uh, the village of uh, Kawan, right? So um, they're free to see their character fight a certain way or to uh, persuade in negotiations a particular way and draw upon these attributes to do said, right? And that's why there isn't guide, guidance that way, right? So uh, that's the best I can explain in our feedback. Feedback, too simple, not enough of a, a probably a traditional rules paradigm for them. And uh, in other words, not enough limitations. Maybe that's it, right? Again, have she said, I'm going to fly across the tent, I would, have, I would have reminded in this fantasy world, you can't fly. Uh, simple, right? But most people I play with are adult and mature. They don't, they don't push the rules like that, right? When I was 13, you'd have a guy say, why can't I jump from here to there? And, you'd, and you know, when they were 12, and you'd say, dude, that's cr you can't do that. Why can't I do that? When we get in that 12-year-old argument, right, with an 11-year-old kid, you know. Uh, we're all adults. We all recognize the, 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 the rules of the universe and the rules of the fantasy, etc. So none of those kind of problems. But I think feeling that he didn't, Hillshaw, again, I'm speaking maybe too much. I'm, I, maybe I'm inferring too much from his, his very little feedback. But I think he wanted his elf to be more of a master of a, of a thing. And I mean a master of a, of a rule block that dictates his elf's weaknesses and strengths and uh, gives him a sense of the role his elf plays in the rule paradigm. And like we, we know exactly what the wizard or the magic user rule paradigm for all D, D, D20. And that rule paradigm is he sucks until he survives and then he becomes amazing, right? Um, 
in this, his elf can be whatever he defines his elf to be, so to speak. Now, his limitations are his weaknesses. See, his body was a two, and he was an archer. He had a sword and a bow, and he had, he had said he earned his three repute as a soldier, as a mercenary soldier. He had no spirit, no prestige, no mind. He put, um, excuse me, he had three, uh, 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 two body and uh, uh, one mind, excuse me. Um, and he put, uh, really, the mind he thought was... Uh, Underutilized. When I said, "Well, that's on you. You've got to, you've got to decide narratively how does your mind play a role here in the communication with uh, the NPCs of the village, etc." But see, Josh is very quiet. I, Josh is one of those that wants to play. I think he wants to play the avatar uh, with this character sheet and all the math and the dice, and just declare whether he's casting a spell, kill, uh, fighting the goblin, or, ta or trying to intimidate the merchant. I mean, he wants to be in this rule paradigm. And that calls on a particular skill or calls on a particular die check. He kind of knows the math and, you know, that's, the, that's his limitations. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to create any kind of narrative space that empowers, uh, that, that, that sets the place. And maybe that's, you know, I, th I don't know how old he is. Uh, I want to say 20s, early 20s. So maybe too, it's just a lack of uh, a, a, a lot of reading and, and background to to you, to bring into play. Right? So anyway, thanks for listening, uh, everybody out there. Have a wonderful weekend. What's left of it, and I'll see you again. Bye.